Cool. Hello all, good morning. And thanks for, for joining me with the future of cloud native application development with Radius. All right, so maybe a quick question. Uh, who here actually does cloud native development? I hope many people. Yeah, I think at least half. Yeah. I hope you are in for a treat today. Have you ever been in a situation where you needed to deploy your software into a landscape that looks somewhat like this? You need to deal with compute, you need to deal with state storage, messaging, TLS encryption, the whole shebang. It could be quite complicated. Well, today I'm here to talk to you about Radius and how Radius could maybe in the future help you deal with this complexity. Let me first start off with a quick introduction about me. Um, hi, my name is Luke Duis. I am CTO and Cloud Architect with a company called Xebia in the Netherlands. And what you are about to see is a glimpse of the future, and that means that uh, stuff is highly likely to go wrong. I did really do my best to prepare everything the best I can, but I am using pre-release software, so well, please bear with me. <coughs> Right, let me take you through the agenda first. So I will take you step by step along a journey through Radius. So I've made a nice roadmap for you, highlighting the features of Radius and uh, demonstrating them by using examples every step of the way. <coughs> I'll start off with a very small application first and gradually add complexity and features all the way up until a somewhat production ready system actually running in the cloud. Well, you can't really look at the future before looking at the past first. So, how did we end up with Radius at all? Well, at the beginning of my career, uh, a long, long time ago, we were still building these monoliths. So, really nice, uh, simple applications, all in one, uh, with the big disadvantage that if the monolith crashes, the entire system could crash. So we started doing microservice-oriented architectures. So distributing parts of the application across the landscape, which made components reusable. But if you did it wrong, you could end up with a big chain of dependencies in which one failure could lead to failures in other systems. At the same time, we were starting to do DevOps, uh, joining together people from operations and uh, development. Well, this really increased the velocity and agility of teams at the cost of, well, teams needing to have more knowledge about each other's work. We started to do microservices as well. And if you do microservices right, then it would be so hard done right, in my mind. But, well, uh, it did deliver teams a lot of autonomy in uh, where they could choose their own technology and all sort of niceness. But you have to know how to run all these services, again, increasing complexity. We started to run our microservices using containers, and we, run, uh, we also run them at scale using container orchestrators. Well, now all of a sudden you have a really nice way to deliver your software, but you need to know how to do it. We started to do cloud-native software development. Well, really quick time to market. Uh, you can use these SaaS services in the cloud, really nice, but you need to know which service to use when. Again, increasing complexity. Well, to answer all this, a new invention, uh, in my mind, this is just DevOps done right, but let's call it a new invention, platform engineering, in which you have a team that supports other IT teams by delivering them features uh, like self-service portals, uh, quick starts into production. Uh, the benefit here is that it finally decreases complexity for product teams. Uh, the investment required here is that you need to know uh, which platform you want to use as the engineering platform. Uh, this is where Radius comes in. Right, so I was talking about a roadmap into production, and in my mind, these are some of the elements that you need to think about before you can take software into production. I'm going to take you through this uh, roadmap step by step. Well, like I said, Radius, in my mind, is a platform engineering tool. So it will uh, enable product teams across the world to deliver software into production at a quick rate. So it aims to be cloud neutral. That means that it cannot just uh, manage Azure, Azure resources, it can also manage AWS resources. In the future, they will add GCP support as well, 
but it's also fine to run Radius in your private cloud or on your laptop. Originally, it was built by an incubation team at Microsoft, but nowadays it is open source and a CNCF sandbox project. That means that anyone here in this room can contribute to Radius as well. The aim of Radius is to reduce the cognitive load for product teams. And they do so by uh, defining this application model, which facilitates collaboration between product teams and platform teams or operations teams, depending on the organization that you have. It is a tool that will allow you to run containerized applications. And as mentioned, it can also manage cloud resources for you. So Radius is really all about collaboration between people doing development and people doing operations. It does so by defining an application model. And with this application model, it adds tools. So you have developer tools to quickly define your application and know what the dependencies are. And you have operations tools to make sure that these dependencies are compliant and secure. Radius also offers assistance to run uh, multiple teams simultaneously, simultaneously, side by side or isolated. And it enables support for your application lifecycle. So you can have multiple <coughs> environments like test environments, production environments, etc. It does so by offering application building blocks. So Radius can use containers, it can define state components, it has messaging support, networking uh, features, and these things called recipes, which are infrastructure templates. Don't worry, this will all come up in uh, demos later. Radius is also an application platform, so Radius itself runs on Kubernetes, and it exposes APIs, which you can talk to using a CLI. And when you talk to these APIs, you can run your own workloads on Kubernetes as well. So it's kind of like inception happening here. Radius itself runs on Kubernetes, but it also runs workloads for you on Kubernetes. <coughs> the way you define one of these application models is by using bicep templates. And well, this is the first demonstration of one of those bicep templates. You can see all these new resource types here. So if you are like me and you come from a, an Azure world, then BICEP is also synonymous for deploying Azure resources. I'll let go of that picture now because BICEP is now the, <laughs> the language that you talk to Radius with. Right, so you can define your application using BICEP. The cool thing here is that it is not just Radius resources that you define here. You can also define cloud resources. So if you want AWS resources, you use BICEP to define them. And Radius will make sure that they are converted into AWS thingies. Cool. Um, uh, yeah. So let's go to our roadmap and cross off the first thing because I believe that we can now safely say, yes, you can run compute on Radius. Well, you need to make sure that your application runs in a specific environment. As mentioned, an environment defines the lifecycle stage of your software. So for example, if you have a test environment that you want to run your application on, then that means you create a Radius environment that is named test. It's important to know that one of these environments is not a security boundary. So stuff running in one environment can see stuff running in the other environment. And this is where resource groups come in. Again, if you are an Azure-minded person, then you may think, hey, is this an Azure resource group? No, this is a Radius resource group that lives in Radius. Right, so this is, in the future, is this will be a security boundary. So right now, today, it is just a logical container of environments and applications. In the future, this will be the place where you can apply role-based access control, shielding different resource groups from others or intentionally allowing people to collaborate in resource groups. A good way to use these resource groups would be one per team, for example, or one per integration of a certain product. Well, the final concept here is Radius Workspaces. Well, I, I've already mentioned that Ray, Radius runs on Kubernetes. 
So a workspace indicates a certain cluster. So a cluster can be running on your machine, it can be running in a cloud somewhere, or private cloud, whatever you want. So a workspace ties a resource group to a cluster. You can have multiple groups on a cluster, you can have multiple clusters, uh, whatever works for you. It is important to realize that the workspace is something that lives on your machine. It is so, sort of similar to the way you use Kubernetes context. So it is a thing that is defined on your laptop in which you say, this is what I want my CLI to talk to, local or remote clusters. All right, so enough talk. Let's see this thing actually at work. So the first application I will show you running on Radius is a very simple front end. It just has a front end, it has no persistence or anything, just one container, nice and simple, but it does allow me to reiterate on the concepts. Well, this is where stuff usually starts going wrong. So I made a script runner here, and uh, that means that all the stuff that I would usually type in, I can now do with my clicker, which is kind of nice. So. The first thing I need to do is to make sure that I'm using the proper workspace. So let me see the workspaces that are on my machine and I will show you as well. <coughs> right, so I have two workspaces defined here on my laptop, cloud and local, to keep it simple. So for this demo I will be using the local workspace, so targeting a Kubernetes cluster on my machine. I will do red group create, so this creates a resource group. And now I can, uh, well, examine my resource group to see if it's all right. I'm sure you all believe it's all right. So let's deploy the first application to that resource group. And I can do that by doing rad run, indicate the bicep template that I want my uh, application to be. I designate it to a certain group and I give it an application name. Well, this could take a little, little time. So while this is running, I will show you the actual template that I'm deploying. And this is, um, well, this is it. It is app v1. It has an environment definition. I named my environment test. Uh, it has an application uh, definition. And it has a single container. So it is uh, not necessarily uh, true that an application only has one moving part. You can have as many moving parts as you want. Multiple containers, multiple uh, supporting dependencies, whatever you need. In this case, it is just a container and uh, I choose to run a container defined by the Radius uh, product team. So it's just a demo that they offer. I didn't write this one myself. And I will expose it at port 3000. Well, the deployment worked, which is nice. So I can now go and click on the URL. And this works because Radius uh, has already created port forwards for me. So it knows where I'm talking to, which cluster I'm talking to. So it can create networking tunnels uh, that allow me to interact with the application running there, which is kind of nice. So this is the application. It's not very spectacular, but uh, well, it will be uh, with the next demo. Right. Uh, a second thing that happened was uh, this additional URL, and that is 7007. Let's see what is up there. And this is the Radius dashboard. So nowadays, every tool that is out there has a dashboard. So Radius has a dashboard as well. And you can use it to examine your environment. So uh, on my local cluster, I have just a single environment. I'm running applications in there, well, the demo that you just uh, saw. And well, I can zoom in on it and see what is happening there. So this is not going to be a very spectacular uh, app graph because I'm just uh, running a single container, but it's there. And we will come back to this dashboard every once in a while to see more elaborate pictures. But for now, this is fine. So let me kill this uh, demo and uh, delete the application. So I'll be ready for the next demo. Right. So let's go back to the roadmap again. So we can cross off team isolation. So because we now know that we can use resource groups to have team isolation and have multiple teams use the radius side by side. 
The next step is to create a nice test environment. Well, you've seen me deploy a single container, but that is not, not usually the way it goes. Usually you would have multiple moving parts in your application. So let's add a little bit complexity here. I'm getting a phone call, jeez. <laughs> Uh, for this, uh, this next stage, I will be running a front-end. Uh, the front-end will be talking to an API, and it will also have a state store uh, to back up the data stored by the API. Now, Radius can definitely help here as well. If you look at this from a developer perspective, you just say, well, uh, I want to store some data. And if I run on my laptop, I want the data to be local. If I want to run in the cloud, in the production environment, I need that to be a cloud service. Uh, what the actual cloud service or uh, container running locally is, I don't really care about that. If you look at it from an operational perspective, then it's a little bit different. So from an ops perspective, you don't really care about what the software is that runs your state stores, but you want that state store to be highly compliant, secured, protected, and private networking, all the niceness. So you really care about the protection of that data. Uh, Radius helps joining these two views together. And it does so by recipes. And recipes are infrastructure templates. So this is where the platform team or the operations people come together with the dev team. So the first thing operations will do is define either bicep templates or terraform templates. And these are, well, Radius templates again, not uh, Azure templates and they define resources the way they see fit. So it could be that they define uh, a Cosmos DB in Azure or a Dynamo DB in AWS, but uh, exactly the way they want it. So all the networking and security features all inside one of those recipes. Then they make sure that the recipe has a specific type, so it can be uh, instantiated later. It needs to return a couple of important values, so the application can be informed about the details of that uh, recipe. And the recipe needs to be published to an OCI compliant registry, let's say a Docker Hub or Azure Container Registry, that sort of thing. And well, as you can see on the right, this does usually involve a little bit of Kubernetes expertise. But, well, if you are uh, part of an operations-minded uh, uh, team, then generally this expertise is available. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. And this is why, so if you look at Radius recipes from a development perspective, so you are consuming these recipes, then um, all the intricacies of Kubernetes will fall away. You just say, hey, I want a recipe because I know the type of the recipe, I will know what type of resource I will get. I'm not interested about the details, so where it runs, I don't care. I just want my resource. And this means that you can have these building blocks that will offer quick paths to either test environments or production environments. And the dev team does not need to know about Kubernetes. Oh, I should have put a, a star with this, because in reality, in a true production system that we will see later, yeah, it, it does leak a little bit, but this is because it's all in uh, preview still. It's important to know that the life cycle of these recipe instances is fully managed by Radius. So if you add one of these recipe instances to your application model, Radius will make sure it's created. If you delete it, uh, Radius will delete the resource as well. And that's something to keep in mind because your database could be gone. <coughs> Well, for all the scenarios in which uh, you don't know the actual type of a resource that you want to deploy, because Radius doesn't have that type yet, but you do want to run that, uh, that service somewhere in your application, uh, this is where extenders come in. So for example, Radius doesn't have any proper open telemetry support, as far as I know. I do want that in my production app, because I want observability. So I'm using an extender here to run Jaeger whenever I run test environments, and I will run OpenTelemetry forwarder when forwarding to application insights when I'm in the cloud later. So extenders are a really nice tool to deal with stuff that is not supported yet by Radius as a, a native service. 
All right, let's look at the roadmap again. We can now say, well, we are uh, familiar with recipes, so we can use test environments because, well, we can we have now uh, got a way to quickly get stuff up and running in test environments. The next step would be to create these sorry to connect these recipes to my application. If I create a, a state store by using a recipe, I need to know uh, how to connect my application to that state store. <coughs> And this is where connections come in. So I have a database. <coughs> it was created by a recipe. It needs to return connection string information from that recipe. And the radius will pass that connection string into my application. And there's no magic happening here. This is just environment variables. So it is vital that your application understands that it will get environment variables specifying connection details. And you need to know, well, you need to make sure that your app uses them to configure itself. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, so it's time for the demo again. So what we will be doing is deploying a front-end uh, that uses a state store. In this situation, it's a Redis state store. Right. Okay, do <coughs> well. Uh, I'll first kick off the deployment and then talk you through it. Please note that I'm now deploying app v2 instead of app v1, and it is a slightly different file. So same application, but now I need to add a recipe to the mix. Well, the way you do that is, of course, first uh, you need to publish the recipe. I did that uh, ahead of time, so I can use it here. So I will assign the recipe to the environment saying whenever you want to create an instance of this type, data store Redis cache, and I'm using this name, default, please use a template stored at this address. Quite simple. <coughs> so then I can say, well, create an instance of that Redis cache here. So again, same type, Redis cache, name default, and that's all I have to do as a developer. And this will magically spin up a Redis cache. Connecting it to my application was done by using a connection. And that you see happening here. So not a lot of work, but uh, a lot of fun nevertheless. The deployment has now succeeded. So if I go back to my browser here, please keep an eye on uh, the gray area here. I will refresh it. And now, all of a sudden, it has a nice state store named orders. And if I look at the environment variables, then you can see, well, yeah, there's no magic happening here. My application received the environment variables through, through radius, so it knows where to find the state store. And now I can start using it. Nice. OK, kill the application again. And just for fun, I will show you the environment definition using the, the RAD CLI. And as you can see, the recipe I just added to my app bicep definition is now also part of the radius infrastructure here. OK, I'll delete the app for the next time I do this uh, talk and continue on to the next slide. Right. Well, we've seen uh, an application. It uses a uh, Redis uh, state store. Uh, so the application itself needs to know that it is using Redis. So it has an SDK to talk to Redis. And it will, well, whenever I want to run in production, I will need to know that I need a Redis state store. But again, as a developer, I don't necessarily care about the implementation of a state store. So this is where Dapper comes into the mix. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with Dapper, but just as a quick res resume, uh, Dapper is a building framework, like it has a lot of tools for building uh, cloud native applications. The main part of Dapper that I'm showing here today is these things called components. And components are abstractions for things like state stores and messaging components. So instead of targeting a Redis state store, I will talk to a Dapper state store. And that allows me to flip the actual implementation in the background. 
again, when I'm running in production, I want a proper state store, Cosmos DB, but I'm, when I'm running on my local host, I want to just use a container. So get quick, uh, get up and running quickly. And this is where the recipes come in, right? Okay, so Dapper and Radius, they are a grouped combination because Dapper is fully supported by Radius. So whenever I need a Dapper state store, Radius uh, can help me with that. Uh, the same thing for pop-up messaging. And this will, of course, come up in our eventual uh, production-ready system. Cool. Well, let's see that in action again. So I will deploy a, ra uh, a Radius application that uses Dapper and then uh, uses a recipe to create the state store and uh, show you a couple of dashboards again. <coughs> Zoom in. Okay, do well. I'll first deploy the app again because it uh, it could take a while. So uh, while this is running, I'm flipping back to the definition of the application. So this is a slightly more. Uh, well, close this. Slightly more complicated demo. So we have Radius application and it has a Dapper state store. Um, so well, I'll take you through it. So a recipe, again, not a Redis recipe, but a Dapper state store. Implementation to be determined. App definition, we already know. And then I have these things called modules. And this is a way to uh, group multiple files together. So just like regular BISA templates, it is possible to start using different files together. And that's what you see me do here. So I have a front-end module and a back-end module. Look at the front end. Um, well, it's a container. It has a few environment variables that specify where to find the back end. And the back end itself, of course, will have a connection to a state store. It also has this extension. And this is the built in uh, support for Dapper that the Radius brings. So, simply by adding this extension to my container, I will enable it to uh, support Dapper. And of course, there is a state store here. It has a specific type, Dapper State Store. It has a name, and I'm indicating that I want to use a recipe here. So that's all I need to do as a developer to get uh, my Dapper app up and running in this environment. If all went well, the deployment was OK. I did make a slight change in the, the way I deployed this. Like the previous time, I did write run, which enabled port forwards out of the box. Now I did rad deploy, and that just deploys the software without giving me tunneling. So in order to get that working, uh, I made a script just to show you uh, that you can also still do this uh, the old school way. And in the future, I hope uh, we will not be using these uh, weird hacks. So the cool thing here is uh, I can use my, uh, my clicker to execute more commands. And that was the, the whole trick behind this, of course. So I can now do uh, Explorer. Uh, and go to the overview dashboard here. So this is the Dapper dashboard. So again, every open source tool has a dashboard. So Dapper has a dashboard. And this is uh, what it looks like. You can look at your application. Right now I'm looking at the, the back end. I can zoom in on uh, how it was configured. And most importantly, I can look at the logs of my uh, system. So this is a way to examine the health of my application landscape. Well, of course, I can also go to my Dapper application itself. So this is it. Um, I can even order stuff here. And uh, well, the fact that it appears in the bottom here means that the state store is actually uh, working. Otherwise, you would get a, get a really nice error message there. And of course, we can also look at the Radius dashboard. And now the app graph should be slightly more interesting than before. So it has a state store component, it has a front end, and the state store is connected to the back end. So the connection is the dotted line here. And you, well, you can see a little bit about what is going on in your application model. <coughs> right, let's clean up those port forwards. So I can do my next demo and go back to the slides. Cool. 
okay, let's look at the roadmap again. We can now see, well, uh, we have a way to do state stores and uh, using Dapper as abstraction, uh, we can easily uh, switch out these state stores at deployment time. Um, we can do the same thing for messaging, so it doesn't really matter uh, whether you're using a state store or a messaging component, as long as you have Dapper as an abstraction in the middle, should be good to go. Well, the next stop on the list would be networking. Now, we've seen the connections bit already, so connecting your application to a data store, but this is about ingress, so traffic coming in from the internet uh, wanting to use your application. And this is why Radius has gateways. So a gateway is sort of a reverse proxy or an ingress controller, and depending on your expertise level of Kubernetes, and it does traffic routing. So all the traffic coming in to your application will go through this gateway, and gateway has routing rules to determine where to send it. And it does so by examining the path of the incoming HTTP request. So in this case, uh, I have three routes here, you can see on the right. If the route uh, anywhere has dash slash API in it, traffic will be sent to my API. I'm also using SignalR, so uh, if it starts with dispatch hub, it will also be sent to the API. And for everything else, uh, it's probably intended for the front end, so it will be sent to the front end. Nice thing about the gateway, it, uh, it also supports uh, TLS offloading or TLS pass-through, whatever you uh, desire. So if you put certificates here, you can also have HTTPS connections to your application. All right, now let's add a little bit more complexity because we now know all these important uh, concepts, of course. <coughs> so let's combine everything here and um, well, zoom in on this sort of production-ready uh, system. So the system that you are now looking at is uh, well uh, a cheap rip-off of a system that we actually have running in uh, production. But well, the the cool thing here is that uh, I made a demo for a different talk, and I well decided to see if I could run it on Radius. Turns out, yeah, we can. And uh, this is what it looks like. So it has a gateway that determines uh, where to send the incoming traffic. We just saw the rules, so it has a front-end bit that, that runs a single-page web application, that is the front-end. It has uh, a back-end, uh, which is the dispatch API. Uh, the front-end will talk to the dispatch API, but not directly. It goes over the public internet, because it's a single-page web app. There's a plant API here. Um, there's no direct communication between the two APIs, nor is there communication directly from the front-end to the plant because the plant is a back, uh, back office API. The only way we talk to that is through pops up messaging. So we need to have a messaging component in there as well. <coughs> and of course, both of these APIs will have a couple of state stores just to make sure that they can uh, well, store the stuff that I'm uh, ordering it to do. And because I'm running on my local environment, I choose the recipes that will create MongoDB containers for state stores. I will use Rabbit pops up for messaging, and I'm using Jaeger, which is an open source, open telemetry collector, and really nice dashboard for my telemetry. <coughs> so this will all run on my local machine. It's important to know that the stuff I've highlighted now is part of the application. So the application model will define all of this. And the stuff in the bottom is the result of choosing different recipes. So the, the fact that I have a MongoDB container is caused because I have, I'm targeting a recipe that is intended for local use. <coughs> okay, let's see that at work. Okay, so I'm going to uh, cheat a little bit here because it's quite a, a large deployment and I didn't want to bore you for, uh, for five minutes. So what I did is I've already deployed the, the pops up messaging bit, the APIs, and I will just stick to the, the front end bit. Here we go. All right. <coughs> well, I need to make sure that I'm still on the right uh, workspace. So 
checking if I'm still on local. That's good to go. And now I can say red deploy again. And in this case, I'm adding a little bit more uh, information to the command line. So I'm not only saying this is the template I want you to deploy, but I'm also adding parameters here. So the parameter is the designated host name. So because I want to support multiple environments, I probably will also need different DNS names to talk to. And this is the way I, <coughs> excuse me, this is the way I chose to do it. And the use HTTPS, that's also something I added to the mix, um, indicating that even though I'm running on localhost, I will still want you to uh, use the TLS gateway. <coughs> All right, so while this is running, I will quickly show you the uh, templates again. And again, um, I promised it would get a little bit more complicated every step of the way. Well, this is uh, way up there in terms of complicated. So the most important bit here is the shared file. So uh, I hope everyone in the back can also read it. Okay. All right. Um, these are the, the parameters that I uh, passed in through the command line. And then, um, well, there's a little bit of stuff here. There's an application. Um, application, I decided, well, I need to tag my application with uh, the team that is actually running this application. And, and this is how you can use the application resource in, uh, in Radius. So just as an FYI. The environment will be a little bit more difficult as well. So this is actually something that, uh, that is bothering me uh, a little bit. So in my mind, an environment should be something um, that you define clearly, but what I did here was define the environment by passing in a parameter that defines the name. So this is like two environments in one. So right now it's the local environment and in my next demo it will be the production environment. And I haven't found a better way of doing this. So I'm still talking to the, the Radius team myself, uh, trying to find out if we can maybe uh, improve this somehow. Because clearly for me this is not working. That's an opinion, right? And I, uh, well, <laughs> cool. Right, then it is time to register the recipes. So my end game is to deploy stuff into production, uh, but right now I'm uh, deploying stuff locally, so I need to know uh, where to find uh, each. So for PubSub brokers, uh, I wanna use Redis when I do stuff locally. So I published a Red, uh, Redis recipe. I want to use a service bus when I deploy to the cloud. Uh, same, similar thing for um, for my Dapper state store. Whenever I run locally, uh, I want to use MongoDB. But if I deploy to the cloud, I want it to use Cosmos. And finally, using these nice extenders, whenever I deploy stuff locally, I use Jaeger for local telemetry. And I want to forward my telemetry to Azure whenever I run in Azure. And that is what this OTLP container does for me. Nice. Okay. Right. Um, let's uh, go here. This is the OpenTelemetry extender itself. So based on the production uh, environment name or the local environment name, I will deploy one recipe on the other. Same thing for dispatch pops up. So this is my shared infrastructure. And that is now done because messaging is part of the entire system, not of a single uh, executable. Telemetry is part of the entire system. I put this in a shared file. <coughs> well, let's see the plant API here. So this is again my uh, API that just talks through uh, pops up messaging. And here you can see the Kubernetes stuff and the Dapper stuff leaking in a little bit. So this is not uh, completely done yet. So now all of a sudden, I need to know a little bit about Kubernetes to get this uh, working properly. For example, uh, this this stuff, I need to well, tag my pods in a certain way to indicate uh, to Kubernetes that I want to configure Dapper in a certain way. So this is, well, the, the abstraction starts leaking a little bit. But well, ignore that for now, that will be better in the future. So this is my plant state, uh, a, sorry, plant state store, uh, the one used by the API. Again, it doesn't have any details about the concrete implementation. This is just a Dapper state store. I think I now talked long enough for the deployment to be completed. Nice, yes. So let's do the tunneling again. Go back. 
And now I can do stuff like uh, using curl calls to uh, check my uh, API, uh, whether it's healthy. Well, you can also already see the network uh, gateway components uh, at work here. So traffic hash slash API in it, so it will be sent to the API. And now I'm going to use a browser to go to uh, localhost without API in it. So that should serve HTML. And because I'm using a self-signed certificate here, it will complain about the certificate. In this case, I choose to ignore it and simply go on. And well, if everything works, then I can now log into my application and start talking to the plant API through the dispatch API. And if everything works, then you should see uh, a nice blue uh, message popping up in the top right corner over here. Right, let's see. Cool. All right, so what happened here was I sent so some stuff to the dispatch API. The dispatch API processed it and validated it, sent a message to the plant API. Plant API did some processing, sent a message back. And then through Signal R, I connected back to my front end to indicate that uh, the processing was done. Well, you don't have to take my word for this because I also have evidence. So let's look at <laughs> let's look at uh, Jaeger. This is the Open Telemetry dashboard I was talking about. <sighs> yeah, this is where the demo guards uh, stop uh, favoring me. Ah, so that is unfortunate. So what you were supposed to see here was uh, the drop-down should have three services, dispatch API, plant API. I would be able to click on uh, the, the messaging and you would see that in fact it did send out a lot of messages accessing state stores and all the niceness that comes with it. But well, this is why uh, we're not shipping it yet, I suppose. Gee, that's too bad. Well, that's... Uh, Unfortunate, but that's the way it goes. All right, so let's look at the radius dashboard to see the app graph. And well, this is, a, you can already see, a little bit more complicated. So this comes uh, close to something that could be considered a production-like system. So it has lots of moving parts, lots of connections between it. And well, um, if you want to talk about it to uh, an operations person as a developer or the other way around, then you can take this model and say, well, uh, I can see this connection here, should we have it? I can see that you have uh, well added stuff to the model. And this is really a nice abstracted model of talking about applications without necessarily talking about lists of resources in Azure or source code in your development environment. I believe this really facilitates collaboration here. Right, kill the port forwards, and I think that's also the end. The demo. All right, yeah, we're getting close. Uh, just one more item left on the roadmap here, and that is to deal with the production environment. Right. It looks very similar to the previous picture I showed. So uh, the application itself has not changed. So the application will be exactly the same one as before, but by using different recipes, I am exchanging MongoDB for Cosmos and Redis PopSwap for Service Bus and Jaeger for App Insights. And let's hope that that one does work for the next demo. So again, the highlighted area, it doesn't change uh, across multiple environments that your application will be deployed to. And by adding the right recipes, you can flip in the right resources in the back. So a little view side by side. The top one doesn't change, the bottom one does change. And the only variable here is the implementation of the recipes that you use. As you can see uh, on the left hand side, everything is running on the cluster. And on the right hand side, only the compute bits are running on the cluster. Right, and now it's time for the most exciting uh, demo, and that is deploying everything to my uh, production uh, cluster. It's also one that, uh, that is highly likely to fail, so uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> All 
Okie doke. Here we go. All right, for this, you guessed it, I need to switch my workspace. So uh, up until now, I've been targeting my local cluster. For now, I will switch to the cloud cluster. So I select the cloud workspace. And the cloud workspace points to an Azure Kubernetes cluster that is running somewhere out there in Azure uh, North Europe. Well, the, the rest of the CLI commands are very familiar. So instead of a group named test, I will create a group named prod. And again, I cheated a little bit. I deployed all the shared stuff before. So I'm now just deploying the, the front end on top, providing uh, the right environment name and a new DNS name to talk to. So this will be demo.lookd.com, which is an actual uh, domain I own. And hopefully we should see the application popping up there. Right, so while that is running, I will quickly show you the uh, different types of recipes. So let's go with uh, the local state store first. Again, ignore most of this, uh, except maybe, uh, yeah, this one. So this is the actual uh, deployment that creates my MongoDB. And it does so by just creating a Kubernetes deployment, uh, designating the Mongo 6 version, creating a Kubernetes service to expose it to the network in the cluster, and uh, returning all the necessary information as return values here. That is part one, the Dapper component. So Dapper knows where to find it. And um, this is the resources. So Kubernetes, sorry. So Radius can delete these resources again when I'm done with them, and a bunch of uh, secrets, which I'm not a big fan of, but this is the connection string to the database being re returned from my recipe, so my application can use it. Well, something very similar for the way I store my state in Azure. So it doesn't use Kubernetes stuff, it uses Azure stuff. So it has Cosmos DB account, Cosmos database, and of course, uh, Cosmos container. And now all of a sudden, uh, for the outside world, I'm just using the recipe. Uh, for the inside world, I'm targeting a, um, an Azure subscription here. Same thing could apply for AWS and in the future for GCP resources. Right, Dapper component again with the connection details for Dapper and the return values for Radius. Well, something very similar uh, you would expect for uh, Service Bus, of course. So Service Bus will uh, deploy Azure Service Bus when running in the cloud, and Redis pops up when running uh, locally. I think by now the deployment should be done. Yep. All right. Close your eyes. Yeah, this is uh, the, the part uh, that you can't really see because there's <laughs> there's a bug in, uh, in Radius be preventing me from my next demo. So uh, everyone close your eyes while I do some Kubernetes voodoo to patch my, uh, my work there. So my demo will actually work. <coughs> right, I will target my AKS cluster and well, patch my HTTP proxy. This is part of the gateway that uh, prevents me from uh, doing signal R. I've now fixed that problem. And well, I've already filed a bug with the team and they are uh, fixing it as we speak. All right, so bug is fixed. So we can now do a curl call. Instead of to local host, I'm going to demolookd.com and my API is running and that is nice. So I can go and open my browser and straight directly go to that uh, dispatching feature causing me to, uh, to log in immediately. And again, if everything goes well, then we should be able to uh, trigger a few messages flowing through the system. Okay, yes. And if we see the blue box popping up, yep, that means that everything is going as expected. And I'm now clicking this button quite a few times. Yeah, that's intentional because I want some stuff to show up in the Azure portal uh, while I'm talking. So if everything works well, then we should actually have something to look at for this step. <coughs> so let's go to the Azure portal and see whether I am not lying and now I'm actually using 
Azure Service Bus instead of Redis pops up locally. <coughs> well, the unfortunate bit is that it takes a little bit of time for this screen to uh, to refresh. So and I now need to stall a little bit, but I can do that by going to the next one and show you Cosmos DB. <coughs> because I know for a fact that this will have some data in it that I can show you and move back to the previous tab later. All right, so this is Cosmos, uh, let's say a database from uh, in Azure, uh, so I can explore its data. It's not going to be very spectacular, uh, but I will zoom in a little bit. So this, uh, this is the, the Cosmos DB I, uh, radius created for me. And if I click here, then, well, let's say, uh, Zoom it. There you go. I clicked on the <coughs> plant state collection and in fact it has a little bit of data here. So I am in fact using this, uh, oops. Yeah, that was not intended. Not to worry though. Nope. That was unfortunate. Right, let's go back to um, the search bus. And uh, fortunately, yes, it does have a spike here indicating that yeah, something is in fact happening to this uh, service bus. And I'm sure you'll believe that was, was caused by me clicking around. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, so the final bit I wanted to show you was the uh, application insights. So um, I've connected uh, my application insights to my environment. So if I go back to the last 30 minutes, then this again, fingers crossed, yeah. Ah. So now my telemetry from my system is flowing uh, from my AKS cluster to application insights. So this makes it sort of a production ready system because I get full insights in what is happening in my system. So you can see the APIs, you can see the Dapper state store, you can see the pub sub messaging happening. And all the telemetry was brought here by forwarding it from my cluster. And it was all gathered by Dapper. So I didn't write a single line of code uh, to get this here, which is I think pretty impressive. Cool. Yeah, back to the slides. So we can f finally check off everything from our uh, nice roadmap. We are ready to go into production. Please don't. So to wrap up, in the future, uh, Radius will help you uh, lower cognitive load for product teams. Um, it will offer quick paths into production for every one of those teams by using application models. So instead of talking about resources or source code, you can now talk about the application definition together. I think it will be very useful, especially in somewhat larger organizations that have platform teams or uh, maybe separate operations teams defining best practices and development teams uh, quickly getting up and running. It will uh, run on AKS or Kubernetes, I should say, it, uh, at first. They are looking at multiple platforms to run at. <coughs> and of course, in the future, uh, you, will, you will hopefully see less bugs and less failing demos uh, because it's continuously being worked on. So with that, uh, if you want to steal my demos, uh, well, go to that URL on, uh, on GitHub. It's all open source. Uh, it has readmes about how I think uh, you should uh, deploy all that stuff. Even uh, the, uh, the, uh, the complicated demo is also open sourced. You can find it all on my uh, GitHub. If you want to learn more about Radius, go to redapp.io. If you have any questions that you want to ask person personally, well, contact me on LinkedIn. And well, with that, I think that's it for me.